This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ophiliad in New South Wales, Australia, November 2006. How to Speak and Write Correctly by Joseph Devlin. Chapter 2 Essentials of English Grammar. Divisions of Grammar, Definitions, Etymology. In order to speak and write the English language correctly, it is imperative that the fundamental principles of the grammar be mastered, for no matter how much we may read of the best authors, no matter how much we may associate with and imitate the best speakers, if we do not know the underlying principles of the correct formation of sentences and the relation of words to one another, we will be to a great extent like the parrot, that merely repeats what it hears without understanding the import of what is said. Of course, the parrot, being a creature without reason, cannot comprehend. It can simply repeat what is said to it. And as it utters phrases and sentences of profanity with as much facility as those of virtue, so, by like analogy, when we do not understand the grammar of the language, we may be making egregious blunders while thinking we are speaking with the utmost accuracy. Divisions of Grammar There are four great divisions of grammar, viz., orthography, etymology, syntax, and prosody. Orthography treats of letters and the mode of combining them into words. Etymology treats of the various classes of words and the changes they undergo. Syntax treats of the connection and arrangements of words in sentences. Prosody treats of the manner of speaking and reading and the different kinds of verse. The three first mentioned concern us most. Letters. A letter is a mark or character used to represent an articulate sound. Letters are divided into vowels and consonants. A vowel is a letter which makes a distinct sound by itself. Consonants cannot be sounded without the aid of vowels. The vowels are A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes W and Y, when they do not begin a word or syllable. Syllables and Words A syllable is a distinct sound produced by a single effort of transcriber's note, one to two words illegible, shall, pig, dog. In every syllable there must be at least one vowel. A word consists of one syllable or a combination of syllables. Many rules are given for the dividing of words into syllables, but the best is to follow as closely as possible the divisions made by the organs of speech in properly pronouncing them. The Parts of Speech Article An article is a word placed before a noun to show whether the noun is used in a particular or general sense. There are two articles, a or an and the. A or an is called the indefinite article because it does not point to any particular person or thing but indicates the noun in its widest sense. Thus, a man means any man whatsoever of the species or race. The is called the definite article because it points out some particular person or thing. Thus, the man means some particular individual. Noun a noun is the name of any person, place, or thing, as John, London, book. Nouns are proper and common. Proper nouns are names applied to particular persons or places. Common nouns are names applied to a whole kind or species. Nouns are inflected by number, gender, and case. Number is that inflection of the noun by which we indicate whether it represents one or more than one. Gender is that inflection by which we signify whether the noun is the name of a male, a female, of an inanimate object, or something which has no distinction of sex. Case is that inflection of the noun which denotes the state of the person, place, or thing represented, as the subject of an affirmation or question, the owner or possessor of something mentioned, or the object of an action or of a relation. Thus, in the example, John tore the leaves of Sarah's book, the distinction between book, which represents only one object, and leaves, which represents two or more objects of the same kind, 
is called number. The distinction of sex between John, a male, and Sarah, a female, and book and leaves, things which are inanimate and neither male nor female, is called gender. And the distinction of state between John, the person who tore the book, and the subject of the affirmation, Mary, the owner of the book, leaves, the objects torn, and book, the object related to leaves, as the whole of which they were a part, is called case. Adjective An adjective is a word which qualifies a noun, that is, shows or points out some distinguishing mark or feature of the noun, as a black dog. Adjectives have three forms called degrees of comparison, the positive, the comparative, and the superlative. The positive is the simple form of the adjective without expressing increase or diminution of the original quality. Nice. The comparative is that form of the adjective which expresses increase or diminution of the quality. Nicer. The superlative is that form which expresses the greatest increase or diminution of the quality. Nicest. Or, an adjective is in the positive form when it does not express comparison, as, a rich man. An adjective is in the comparative form when it expresses comparison between two or between one and a number taken collectively, as, John is richer than James. He is richer than all the men in Boston. An adjective is in the superlative form when it expresses a comparison between one and a number of individuals taken separately, as, John is the richest man in Boston. Adjectives expressive of properties or circumstances which cannot be increased have only the positive form, as, a circular road, the chief end, an extreme measure. Adjectives are compared in two ways, either by adding er to the positive to form the comparative and est to the positive to form the superlative, or by prefixing more to the positive for the comparative and most to the positive for the superlative, as handsome, handsomer, handsomest, or handsome, more handsome, most handsome. Adjectives of two or more syllables are generally compared by prefixing more and most. Many adjectives are irregular in comparison, as bad, worse, worst, good, better, best. Pronoun A pronoun is a word used in place of a noun, as John gave his pen to James and he lent it to Jane to write her copy with it. Without the pronouns, we would have had to write this sentence, John gave John's pen to James, and James lent the pen to Jane to write Jane's copy with the pen. There are three kinds of pronouns, personal, relative, and adjective pronouns. Personal. Pronouns are so called because they are used instead of the names of persons, places, and things. The personal pronouns are I, thou, he, she, and it with their plurals, we, ye, or you, and they. I is the pronoun of the first person, because it represents the person speaking. Thou is the pronoun of the second person, because it represents the person spoken to. He, she, it are the pronouns of the third person, because they represent the persons or things of whom we are speaking. Like nouns, the personal pronouns have number, gender, and case. The gender of the first and second person is obvious, as they represent the person or person speaking, and those who are addressed. The personal pronouns are thus declined. First person, masculine or feminine. N singular, I. N plural, we. P singular, mine. P plural, ours. O singular, me. O plural, us. Second person, masculine or feminine. N singular, thou. N plural, you. P singular, thine. 
P. Plural. Yours. O. Singular. The. O. Plural. You. Third person, masculine. N. Singular. He. N. Plural. They. P. Singular. His. P. Plural. Theirs. O. Singular. Him. O. Plural. Them. Third person, feminine. N. Singular. She. N. Plural. They. P. Singular. Hers. P. Plural. Theirs. O. Singular. Her. O. Plural. Them. Third person, neuter. N. Singular. It. N. Plural. They. P. Singular. Its. P. Plural. Theirs. O. Singular. It. O. Plural. Them. N.B. In colloquial language and ordinary writing, thou, thine, and thee are seldom used, except by the Society of Friends. The plural form you is used for both the nominative and objective singular in the second person, and yours is generally used in the possessive, in place of thine. The relative pronouns are so called because they relate to some word or phrase going before, as, the boy who told the truth. He has done well, which gives me great pleasure. Here, who and which are not only used in place of other words, but who refers immediately to boy, and which to the circumstance of his having done well. The word or clause to which a relative pronoun refers is called the antecedent. The relative pronouns are who, which, that, and what. Who is applied to persons only, as the man who was here. Which is applied to the lower animals and things without life, as the horse which I sold, the hat which I bought. That is applied to both persons and things, as the friend that helps, the bird that sings, the knife that cuts. What is a compound relative, including both the antecedent and the relative, and is equivalent to that which, as I did what he desired, i.e., I did that which he desired. Relative pronouns have the singular and plural alike. Who is either masculine or feminine. Which and that are masculine, feminine or neuter. What, as a relative pronoun, is always neuter. That and what are not inflected. Who and which are thus declined. Singular and plural. N. Who. N. Which. P. Whose. P. Whose. O. Whom. O. Which. Who, which and what, when used to ask questions, are called interrogative pronouns. Adjective. Pronouns partake of the nature of adjectives and pronouns and are subdivided as follows. Demonstrative adjective pronouns, which directly point out the person or object. They are this, that, with their plurals, these, those, and yon, same and self-same. Distributive adjective pronouns used distributively. They are each, every, either, neither. Indefinite adjective pronouns used more or less indefinitely. They are any, all, few, some, several, one, other, another, none. Possessive adjective pronouns denoting possession. They are my, thy, his, her, its, our, your, their. NB. The possessive adjective pronouns differ from the possessive case of the personal pronouns in that the latter can stand alone, while the former cannot. Who owns that book? It is mine. You cannot say, it is my. The word book must be repeated. The verb. A verb is a word which implies action or the doing of something, 
or it may be defined as a word which affirms, commands, or asks a question. Thus the words John the table contain no assertion, but when the word strikes is introduced, something is affirmed. Hence the word strikes is a verb, and gives completeness and meaning to the group. The simple form of the verb without inflection is called the root of the verb, e.g. love is the root of the verb to love. Verbs are regular or irregular, transitive or intransitive. A verb is said to be regular when it forms the past tense by adding ed to the present, or d if the verb ends in e. When its past tense does not end in ed, it is said to be irregular. A transitive verb is one the action of which passes over to or affects some object, as, I struck the table. Here the action of striking affected the object, table, hence struck is a transitive verb. An intransitive verb is one in which the action remains with the subject, as, I walk, I sit, I run. Many intransitive verbs, however, can be used transitively. Thus, I walk the horse. Walk is here transitive. Verbs are inflected by number, person, tense and mood. Number and person, as applied to the verb, really belong to the subject. They are used with the verb to denote whether the assertion is made regarding one or more than one, and whether it is made in reference to the person speaking, the person spoken to, or the person or thing spoken about. Tense In their tenses, verbs follow the divisions of time. They have present tense, past tense, and future tense, with their variations to express the exact time of action as to an event happening, having happened, or yet to happen. Mood There are four simple moods, the infinitive, the indicative, the imperative, and the subjunctive. The mood of a verb denotes the mode or manner in which it is used. Thus, if it is used in its widest sense without reference to person or number, time or place, it is in the infinitive mood, as to run. Here we are not told who does the running, when it is done, where it is done, or anything about it. When a verb is used to indicate or declare or ask a simple question, or make any direct statement, it is in the indicative mood. The boy loves his book. Here a direct statement is made concerning the boy. Have you a pin? Here a simple question is asked, which calls for an answer. When the verb is used to express a command or entreaty, it is in the imperative mood, as, Go away. Give me a penny. When the verb is used to express doubt, supposition, or uncertainty, or when some future action depends upon a contingency, it is in the subjunctive mood, as, If I come, he shall remain. Many grammarians include a fifth mood called the potential to express power, possibility, liberty, necessity, will or duty. It is formed by means of the auxiliaries may, can, ought and must, but in all cases it can be resolved into the indicative or subjunctive. Thus in I may write if I choose, may write is by some classified as in the potential mood, but in reality the phrase, I may write, is an indicative one, while the second clause, if I choose, is the expression of a condition upon which not my liberty to write depends, but my actual writing. Verbs have two participles, the present or imperfect, sometimes called the active ending in ing, and the past or perfect, often called the passive, ending in ed or d. The infinitive expresses the sense of the verb in a substantive form, the participles in an adjective form, as, to rise early is healthful, an early rising man, the newly risen sun. The participle in ing is frequently used as a substantive and consequently is equivalent to an infinitive. Thus, to rise early is healthful, and rising early is healthful are the same. The principal parts of a verb are the present indicative, past indicative, and past participle, as love, loved, loved. Sometimes one or more of these parts are wanting, and then the verb is said to be defective. Present, can, past, could, passive participle, wanting. 
present may past might passive participle wanting present shall past should passive participle wanting present will past would passive participle wanting present ought past ought passive participle wanting verbs may also be divided into principal and auxiliary a principal verb is that without which a sentence or clause can contain no assertion or affirmation an auxiliary is a verb joined to the root or participles of a principal verb to express time and manner with greater precision than can be done by the tenses and moods in their simple form thus the sentence i am writing an exercise when i shall have finished it i shall read it to the class has no meaning without the principal verbs writing finished read but the meaning is rendered more definite especially with regard to time by the auxiliary verbs am have shall there are nine auxiliary or helping verbs viz be have do shall will may can ought and must they are called helping verbs because it is by their aid the compound tenses are formed to be the verb to be is the most important of the auxiliary verbs it has eleven parts viz am art is are was wast were wert be being and been voice the active voice is that form of the verb which shows the subject not being acted upon but acting as the cat catches mice charity covers a multitude of sins the passive voice when the action signified by a transitive verb is thrown back upon the agent, that is to say, when the subject of the verb denotes the recipient of the action, the verb is said to be in the passive voice. John was loved by his neighbours. Here John, the subject, is also the object affected by the loving. The action of the verb is thrown back on him, hence the compound verb, was loved, is said to be in the passive voice. The passive voice is formed by putting the perfect participle of any transitive verb with any of the eleven parts of the verb to be. Conjugation The conjugation of a verb is its orderly arrangement in voices, moods, tenses, persons and numbers. Here is the complete conjugation of the verb love, active voice. Principal parts Present, love Past, loved Past participle, loved. Infinitive mood, to love. Indicative mood, present tense. Singular first person, I love. Plural first person, we love. Singular second person, you love. Plural second person, you love. Singular third person, he loves. Plural third person, they love past tense singular first person i loved plural first person we loved singular second person you loved plural second person you loved singular third person he loved plural third person they loved future tense singular first person i shall love plural first person they will love Singular second person, you will love. Plural second person, you will love. Singular third person, he will love. Plural third person, we shall love. Transcriber's note, first person plural and third person plural reversed in original. Present perfect tense. First person singular, I have loved. First person plural we have loved second person singular you have loved second person plural you have loved third person singular he has loved third person plural they have loved past perfect tense first person singular i had loved first person plural we had loved second person singular you had loved second person plural 
you had loved. Third person singular, he had loved. Third person plural, they had loved. Future perfect tense. First person singular, I shall have loved. First person plural, we shall have loved. Second person singular, you will have loved. Second person plural, you will have loved. Third person singular, he will have loved. Third person plural, they will have loved. Imperative mood, present tense only. Second person singular, love, you. Second person plural, love, you. Subjunctive mood, present tense. First person singular, if I love. First person plural, if we love. Second person singular, if you love. Second person plural, if you love. Third person singular, if he love. Third person plural, if they love. Past tense. First person singular, if I loved. First person plural, if we loved. Second person singular, if you loved. Second person plural, if you loved. Third person singular, if he loved. Third person plural, if they loved. Present perfect tense. First person singular, if I have loved. First person plural, if we have loved. Second person singular, if you have loved. Second person plural, if you have loved. Third person singular, if he has loved. Third person plural, if they have loved. Past perfect tense. First person singular, if I had loved. First person plural, if we had loved. Second person singular, if you had loved. Second person plural, if you had loved. Third person singular, if he had loved. Third person plural, if they had loved. Infinitives. Present. To love. Perfect. To have loved. Participles. Present. Loving. Past. Loved. Perfect. Having loved. Conjugation of to love. Passive voice. Indicative mood. Present tense. First person singular. I am loved. First person plural. We are loved. Second person singular. You are loved. Second person plural. You are loved. Third person singular. He is loved. Third person plural. They are loved. Past tense. First person singular. I was loved. First person plural. We were loved. Second person singular. You were loved. Second person plural. You were loved. Third person singular. He was loved. Third person plural. They were loved. Future tense. First person singular. I shall be loved. First person plural. We shall be loved. Second person singular. You will be loved. Second person plural. You will be loved. Third person singular. He will be loved. Third person plural. They will be loved. Present perfect tense. First person singular. I have been loved. First person plural. We have been loved. Second person singular. You have been loved. Second person plural. You have been loved. Third person singular. He has been loved. Third person plural. They have been loved. Past perfect tense. First person singular. I had been loved. First person plural. We had been loved. Second person singular. You had been loved. Second person plural. You had been loved. Third person singular. He had been loved. Third person plural. They had been loved. Future perfect tense. First person singular. I shall have been loved. First person plural. We shall have been loved. Second person singular. You will have been loved. Second person plural. You will have been loved. Third person singular. He will have been loved. 
third person plural. They will have been loved. Imperative mood. Present tense only. Second person singular. Be, you, loved. Second person plural. Be, you, loved. Subjunctive mood. Present tense. First person singular. If I be loved. First person plural. If we be loved. Second person singular. If you be loved. Second person plural. If you be loved. Third person singular. If he be loved. Third person plural. If they be loved. Past tense. First person singular. If I were loved. First person plural. If they were loved. Second person singular. If you were loved. Second person plural. If you were loved. Third person singular. If he were loved. Third person plural. If we were loved. Present perfect tense. First person singular. If I have been loved. First person plural. If we have been loved. Second person singular. If you have been loved. Second person plural. If you have been loved. Third person singular. If he has been loved. Third person plural. If they have been loved. Past perfect tense. First person singular. If I had been loved. First person plural. If we had been loved. Second person singular. If you had been loved. Second person plural. If you had been loved. Third person singular. If he had been loved. Third person plural. If they had been loved. Infinitives. Present. To be loved. Perfect. To have been loved. Participles. Present. Being loved. Past. Being loved. Perfect. Having been loved. NB. Note that the plural form of the personal pronoun you is used in the second person singular throughout. The old form thou, except in the conjugation of the verb to be, may be said to be obsolete. In the third person singular, he is representative of the three personal pronouns of the third person, he, she, and it. Adverb. An adverb is a word which modifies a verb, an adjective, or another adverb. Thus, in the example, he writes well, the adverb shows the manner in which the writing is performed. In the examples, he is remarkably diligent, and he works very faithfully, the adverbs modify the adjective diligent, and the other adverb faithfully, by expressing the degree of diligence and faithfulness. Adverbs are chiefly used to express in one word what would otherwise require two or more words. Thus, there signifies in that place. Whence, from what place. Usefully, in a useful manner. Adverbs, like adjectives, are sometimes varied in their terminations to express comparison and different degrees of quality. Some adverbs form the comparative and superlative by adding er and est, as soon, sooner, soonest. Adverbs which end in ly are compared by prefixing more and most, as nobly, more nobly, most nobly. A few adverbs are irregular in the formation of the comparative and superlative, as well, better, best. Preposition A preposition connects words, clauses and sentences together and shows the relation between them. My hand is on the table shows relation between hand and table. Prepositions are so called because they are generally placed before the word whose connection or relation with other words they point out. Conjunction. A conjunction joins words, clauses and sentences, as John and James. My father and mother have come, but I have not seen them. The conjunctions in most general use are and, also, either, or, neither, nor, though, yet, but, however, for, that, because, since, Therefore, wherefore, then, if, unless, lest. Interjection An interjection is a word used to express some sudden emotion of the mind. Thus, in the examples, 
Ah, there he comes. Alas, what shall I do? Ah expresses surprise and alas, distress. Nouns, adjectives, verbs and adverbs become interjections when they are uttered as exclamations as nonsense, strange, hail, away, etc. We have now enumerated the parts of speech and as briefly as possible stated the functions of each. As they all belong to the same family, they are related to one another, but some are in closer affinity than others. To point out the exact relationship and the dependency of one word on another is called parsing. And in order that every etymological connection may be distinctly understood, a brief resume of the foregoing essentials is here given. The signification of the noun is limited to one, but to any one of the kind by the indefinite article, and to some particular one or some particular number by the definite article. Nouns in one form represent one of a kind, and in another any number more than one. They are the names of males or females, or of objects which are neither male nor female, and they represent the subject of an affirmation, a command or a question, the owner or possessor of a thing, or the object of an action or of a relation expressed by a preposition. Adjectives express the qualities which distinguish one person or thing from another. In one form they express quality without comparison. In another they express comparison between two or between one and a number taken collectively. And in a third they express comparison between one and a number of others taken separately. Pronouns are used in place of nouns. One class of them is used merely as the substitutes of names. The pronouns of another class have a peculiar reference to some preceding words in the sentence of which they are the substitutes, and those of a third class refer adjectively to the persons or things they represent. Some pronouns are used for both the name and the substitute, and several are frequently employed in asking questions. Affirmations and commands are expressed by the verb, and different inflections of the verb express number, person, time and manner. With regard to time, an affirmation may be present, or past, or future. With regard to manner, an affirmation may be positive or conditional, it being doubtful whether the condition is fulfilled or not, or it being implied that it is not fulfilled. The verb may express command or entreaty, or the sense of the verb may be expressed without affirming or commanding. The verb also expresses that an action or state is or was going on, by a form which is also used sometimes as a noun, and sometimes to qualify nouns. Affirmations are modified by adverbs, some of which can be inflected to express different degrees of modification. Words are joined together by conjunctions, and the various relations which one thing bears to another are expressed by prepositions. Sudden emotions of the mind and exclamations are expressed by interjections. Some words, according to meaning, belong sometimes to one part of speech, sometimes to another. Thus, in after a storm comes a calm, calm is a noun. In it is a calm evening, calm is an adjective. And in calm your fears, calm is a verb. The following sentence, containing all the parts of speech, is passed etymologically. I now see the old man coming. But alas, he has walked with much difficulty. I, a personal pronoun, first person singular, masculine or feminine gender, nominative case, subject of the verb see. Now, an adverb of time modifying the verb see. See, an irregular transitive verb, indicative mood, present tense, first person singular to agree with its nominative or subject I. The the definite article particularizing the noun man. Old, an adjective positive degree qualifying the noun man. Man, a common noun, third person singular, masculine gender, objective case governed by the transitive verb see. Coming, the present or imperfect participle of the verb to come, referring to the noun man. But, a conjunction. Alas, an interjection, expressing pity or sorrow. He, a personal pronoun, third person singular, masculine gender, nominative case, subject of verb has walked. Has walked, a regular intransitive verb, 
indicative mood, perfect tense, third person singular to agree with its nominative or subject, he. With, a preposition, governing the noun difficulty. Much, an adjective, positive degree, qualifying the noun difficulty. Difficulty, a common noun, third person singular, neuter gender, objective case governed by the preposition, with. NB. Much is generally an adverb. As an adverb, it is thus compared. Positive. Much. Comparative. More. Superlative. Most. End of chapter 2